Good morning, Pascagoula. <laughs> How are y'all? I don't know about you guys, but this weather is awesome. Amen. Um, and it leads me to uh, start thinking about the fall, which means food, which means good stuff. So next Sunday, right after worship service, the youth is hosting the bake sale. And so don't run out of here and go to the buffet before you get something good to take home with you. That's right. All right. Sure. And everything's low carb and no sugar, I promise. <laughs> um, all right. That's why we call it dessert. Huh? Well, please note your bulletin, some of the things that are coming up. The Hype Girls is going to have a night out. Um, uh, senior ministry opportunity. Uh, for any of you that miss movies that have been on the screen, some wonderful inspirational movies, we're offering them on the third Thursdays of the month here at our church. Just come at 10 o'clock um, into the activities room and we will view uh, this coming Thursday, Amazing Grace. It's the story behind the hymn uh, that we know so well. And lunch will be provided. Uh, also, uh, please note that the flowers that have graced our worship are in memory of Mason Summerall er, and uh, their, their anniversary, Mason and Sandra Summerall's anniversary. So we give God thanks for those. Uh, let's pause now and as we prepare for worship, bowing our hearts and going to God in prayer as our pastor leads us. Pray with me. Holy God, you have called us to watch and pray this morning. Therefore, whatever may be the sin against which we are praying, make us careful to watch against it. And so have reason to expect that our prayers will indeed be answered. In order to perform this duty, we pray that you grant us grace to preserve a sober and equal temper and sincerity to pray for your assistance. And so give us, O Lord, this morning steadfast hearts which no unworthy thought can drag down. Give us unconquered hearts which no tribulation can wear out. Give us upright hearts, which no unworthy purpose may tempt aside. And bestow on us, God, understanding to know You, diligence to seek You, wisdom to find You, and faithfulness that may finally embrace You through the Christ who dwells with you in the Holy Spirit, both now and forever, eternally one God. Amen. This time of year prompts me personally to praise God for the beauty of creation around. I invite you all to stand and join the choir as we praise God for the beauty of this earth. <laughs>
us remain standing as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, choir. We'd like to invite our children to come forward at this time, to come down to meet Miss Christina here at the front. Come on, you can do better. Good. Good. Great. It is so beautiful outside. How can you not be great today? Really? Did you pay attention when you were out there at all? Kinda. Yes. Kinda nice and cool. Makes you want to go home and just sit out back, doesn't it? Yes. Kinda. Kinda. I think it's good football weather. Good day to sit out back, watch football games. How many of you watch football? I used to with my dad. With your dad? So if I asked you if you were a football fan, would you know what the word fan meant? Mm -hmm. What's it mean? It meant like, not the one you like. So you like, like, like it. Like you follow it. You follow it. There you go. So you, you like a particular team and, and you want to watch it all the time. Or it, it doesn't have to just be sports. It could be your favorite music band or... Um, Baseball team? That's exactly, see, he knows right where I'm going. So, but, there are some fans who are just die-hard fans. It doesn't matter whether the team's winning or losing. It doesn't matter whether they play. That is their team. We've got a couple of families like that in our church, don't we? Die-hard. Can I talk about Okay. You know, there was this one football team years ago years and years ago, that got so bad that the fans put brown grocery bags over their heads, you know? <laughs> they were there at the game. They just didn't want anybody to know it was them, you know? Jesus had fans. When he started traveling and, and he was going from place to place, I mean, the crowds just started following him and, and coming up to see what he was doing. You know, we talked about the time when there were so many people and they'd been there so long, the disciples were like, look, we got to feed them. You know, and he did the miracle with the fish and the bread. But they didn't stay fans. And Jesus knew that. And he looked at them. He said, look, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to give it up. You've got to pick up your cross. You have to live your life like I do if you want to be a follower. You know, when you have a favorite football team, you can wear the, the, the shirts and you can have the stickers on your wall and the flags. But if they lose a game, you can just take them right back down, can't you? It's the same thing with the crosses we wear. We can wear a cross on our necklace or on a bracelet. We can have the little bracelets that say, what would Jesus do? But if you don't live your life like Jesus wants you to, then that's all you are as a fan. And we want to be followers. We want to pick up our cross we want to study our Bibles and learn and be a follower. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, be with these children as they go forth this week. I pray that they open their hearts and they show the people around them that they are a follower. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to go to the other side. You want to go with me?
Jesus, you offered your life for us. Your mercy and grace is new every morning. Thank you for these gifts you've given to us. May we love you back, Lord, with our lives, uh, transformed by your spirit, and offer our resources that you have blessed us with to see your kingdom grow. For it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> As we enter our congregational prayer time, I'd like to have you note on the back of your bulletin a statement uh, that we placed there in place of our prayer concerns. Uh, we felt it was um, uh, something that we needed to bring your attention to, and we'll, of course, have our concerns back on there next week. But this is a request uh, by the Confessing Movement in our uh, denomination to join us and other United Methodists in praying the Lord's Prayer at noon each day for the United Methodist Church in the 2016 General Conference. Uh, there's uh, much that will be addressed in 
we need to be in prayer for our church and um, the issues that we're facing as a denomination. So please uh, make note of that when the clock strikes 12. Think about that in praying for your church, praying for the church, uh, the United Methodist Church around the world and the General Conference. Uh, in this time, I'm uh, going to request uh, Virginia to play a song of meditation as we lift up our concerns, a time for you to pray for what uh, your needs are and for the needs of others that you may be aware of. And then um, I'd like to, with this being a, a time of this past week of reflecting on 9-11, uh, I would like to offer a prayer uh, in that uh, behalf before we join together on the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray now together. Almighty God, our hope and our refuge. In our distress, we come quickly to you. Shock and horror of that tragic day have subsided, replaced now with an emptiness, a longing for an innocence lost. We come remembering those who lost their lives in New York and Washington, D.C. and Pennsylvania. We are mindful of the sacrifice of public servants who demonstrated the greatest love of all by laying down their lives for friends. We come remembering, and we come in hope, not in ourselves, but in you. And Lord, we pray for our enemies that they may know your truth and turn to you. In commemorating this tragedy, we give you thanks for your presence, Lord. Your presence in our time of need. And we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. Our guide, our salvation. Amen. May we continue to pray as we pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, we are actually not changing into a different sermon series. We're actually continuing in the same sermon series. When I first started, um, I said it would have three main movements. Now, this was a couple months ago. The first movement would be how it is to love God back from our side, loving God. But Jesus' main thrust when he taught wasn't just love God. It was love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as your 
So there are three main movements here. The first is loving God. We spent a few Sundays, a couple, on that. Now we're switching into, transitioning into loving, loving our neighbor. What does that look like? Um, and I am so <laughs> glad that the weather is good because this sermon is horrible. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, it's going to balance it out. I'm gonna, you felt good all morning, and I'm just going to clobber you, but then you're going to get out of here, and there's football and good weather, and it's all going to be good. It's all going to be great. Um, that's the way muscles are built. Talk to my people who know physical training. You tear the muscle fibers apart. That's what I'm going to do. It's hard work. But then the proteins come in and build it back up stronger. You come back stronger. So you're going to be better for this, okay? All right. Just bear with me. So the reason why it's so uncomfortable is because, uh, in, my, in my experience, this topic just, just sits right in the pew right beside you there's no way of getting around it um you know when i had when i had my little time off on sabbatical i would go to churches and one of the strangest things that would happen is i would sit in a pew and no one else on the pew and someone else would come and sit down not only in my pew there's a pew to the left pew to the right pew behind me my pew but then they would like sit right next to me and the one person even sat so close that their hip touched me. I mean, that is uncomfortable. Now, that's what I'm talking about. This topic is, <laughs> Jamie has this whole pew. It's going to sit, it could sit over there, but it's going to sit right there. And me too. It always has. Uh, the verse of Scripture we'll be reading from is Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. Hear now the word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends his rain, his beautiful fall football weather, on the just and the unjust. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is the word of God for you and for me, the people of God. Thanks be to you. Amen. Now, the, the first topic of loving our neighbor is loving our enemy. Oh, man. That is not easy. Um, it's easy to conceive. Very easy. All you really have to do is take the person who is in the enemy category and switch them into a neighbor category. And then you can love them. No problem. You can love your neighbor. But doing that, transitioning someone from the enemy category in your mind to neighbor category in your mind is a different story. Now, my experience is one of the biggest hindrances that folks have to loving their enemy is, first of all, um, fessing up. Acknowledging the fact that they do indeed have those who they consider, in their mind, in the category of enemy. Now, you may say, oh, Brother Eddie, I'm a Christian. I don't have enemies. And I will say, liar, liar. You may think you don't, but if you reframe it in your mind, 
I think you will start picturing people, okay? We all do this. And, and look, it's really simple. Uh, there are times, you know, when I get in a fight with people that live right in my home, and I consider the air between me and the person who I am closest to to be dirty air. So you can consider anyone, even those closest to you, an enemy. Um, think of it this way. Who, don't think who's my enemy. Think, um, who do you hate the most? Oh, Brother Eddie, I'm Christian. I don't hate. Okay. Who do you love the least? <laughs> oh, Brother Eddie, I follow Jesus. I love everyone the same way. Okay. <laughs> Who do you like the least? Who do you fear the most? An enemy just needs to be reframed in your mind. Don't think of it as someone whom you can't stand for the rest of your life, period. Think of it as someone who has maybe not done you well. You remember that? Or maybe, that's in the past, they have not done you well. Maybe it's someone who you're pretty sure doesn't mean you well. There's a lot of different ways to look at this. Now, one thing you need to know about this very book that we call our story, the narrative of the unfolding of who we are as a people, is that this book is most colored by the idea that God's people had, have, and assumes that we will have enemies. If you say you don't, you're, just, you're lying to yourself. Uh, the story of Jonah is most impactful because if you understand the history, because he had enemies. Um, Jonah, you probably know, called to preach to Nineveh. You probably know he went the absolute op opposite way to Tarshish. What you may not know is the folks in Nineveh were of the capital of Assyria. And Assyria was at the time Israel's harshest political enemy. Jonah saw the Ninevites as political others. He was pretty sure God wanted to bless them. And he simply did not want to be a part of God's desire to bless them. Jonah, Jonah isn't so fascinating because he was in the belly of a fish for three days. I mean, that's what most people remember, and that's fascinating. But the point is, here is someone that God is saying, I want to bless these people through you. And he says, I don't want to be a part of that. So think of an enemy that way, okay? Just get real. Take your steel-toed boots off for a second. Put your Jesus sandals on. Let your toes just sort of dangle out there. Okay, we're going to step on them. Who in your life, if you had it in your power to bless, you wouldn't? Now, you may say there's no one in my life like that. Really? I bet there's someone in your life that you could call up today, 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 and say, you know what? My part in that thing, for my part, Yeah, I'm sorry. Blessing. Blessing right there. Not blessing? Blessing. Not blessing? Blessing. You know you can picture someone. Oh, I wouldn't do that like Jonah, Brother Eddie. Okay. Or, think of it this way. When Jesus was uh, overhearing the spiritual elite of his day, they were being meanies. Right? Right? Scripture says the religious elite of Jesus' day were meanies. They, they made enemies. They were enemies. And as he was overhearing them, based on their conversation, he decided to give them a parable, a moment to stop and teach. Um, this is where the prodigal son comes from. Luke chapter 15. Look it up. Now, 
you may have most identified maybe with the wayward son. Yeah, that's what it's about. We all have children who go their own way and they live in prodigal living. And that's true. No doubt I related to that kid when I was a teenager. Or maybe you've had kids and you relate to the father. Oh, when is my child going to do that to me? Leave my house and just live in ways that he or she knows will not bless them or anyone else. You may have related to the father. But Jesus main character may have been, rather, since he was talking to spiritual meanies, the second son. The brother who, when the prodigal son came back, he simply did not want dad to have a party for his brother. It's almost as if the gnashing of his teeth when his brother got back was so loud that the reader couldn't even hear the wonderful sounds of celebration going on at the party. So here's the idea. This second brother, though God was already pouring favor on someone, the second brother couldn't celebrate it. All right? So think of it this way. Do you have someone in your life that if things start going good for them, it's hard for you to celebrate with them? Someone in your life, something's going well, and it's just not easy to celebrate. I guess you guys are more spiritual than me. Okay, David had enemies. One of the most central figures in Scripture. Uh, if you read the book of Psalms, these are David's prayers. A lot of them, he's praying for protection against his enemies. Or there are some of his prayers that he is praying for God to harm His enemies. God, here's, I'm paraphrasing, may they be like a slug on a hot tin roof at noon. That's one of His prayers. You don't think that's common among the spiritual elite to pray for harm against other people? Uh, I remember when uh, the disciples, I, I remember like I was there, I remember reading the disciples in Jesus going through Samaria, they're not getting treated right. Do you remember what the disciples said? Jesus! You want us to call down hellfire and just burn them down? Imagine if you had that kind of power in your prayer. Driving. <laughs> David, David had enemies ubiquitously. In other words, they surrounded him on all sides. Not just on the outside, but on the inside of his family. Um... One of David's biggest enemies was one of his sons, Absalom. Absalom wanted to become king while David was king. And one of the moves he made, you may know the scripture. The scripture is not a PG story. If you read the adult version, uh, Absalom, David's son, took all of David's wives and concubines to the top of the palace and had biblical relations in front of everyone. Now this idea, get this, this idea of Absalom's did not originate in his brain. It was whispered into his ear by a fellow by the name of Ahithophel. Now, you may not know that Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba. So for 11 years, Ahithophel, the grandfather of Bathsheba, was stewing. How could David do that to my granddaughter? How could David do that to my granddaughter's husband, Uriah the Hittite, who was above reproach? <coughs> and so when the time was right, now, for 11 years, it seemed like Ahithophel was cool. But Ahithophel was stewing. And when the time was right, read, read this book, whispered into Absalom's ear the idea. So, think of an enemy this way. Is there someone in your life that when their image enters your brain, you stew a little bit? Don't even lie. Don't even poke the back 
of the head of the person sitting in front of you with your nose. <laughs> you know it happens. Or, or, when their name comes up in conversation, Ahithophel didn't just do, Ahithophel attacked David with his words. Someone's name comes up in conversation, and you throw a little bit in there. Yeah. It happens. So, here's a verse of Scripture. If, if you will get through the first hump of just acknowledging, which we all do, we have these people in our lives, there is some air in between us and them that's just not as clean as we'd like it, and we want to work on it. Right? So, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, some really good verses. A, a church that was getting embroiled in just sort of devouring one another. They loved Jesus. They, they wanted to follow his, his word, but it was just getting chaotic. And so he wrote to them. Chapter 4. I'll read just a few verses. Now this first verse is what frees me. Very liberating. Be angry... This is chapter 4, verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. It doesn't say don't be angry. Anger, something that happens. But it says, be angry and do not sin. You've heard this verse. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Verse 27, give no place to the devil. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Paul was hearkening back to one of Jesus' biggest lessons. One of Jesus' biggest lessons to his disciple was this. Um, you have a choice between heaven and hell, and it's not necessarily, he didn't harp on one's eternal abode, although it came up, but his, his main idea of heaven and hell was this. God is up to creating the kingdom of heaven right around you, right now. Not, not thousands of years, years later, but right now he's in your midst. Your choices contribute to whether or not you're being a part of grabbing heaven pulling it down to our earth or reaching down grabbing hell and pulling it up jesus thought the decisions of his followers were that important listen to paul verse 27 we just read it don't give place to the devil in your anger don't reach down and pull hell up rather pull heaven down all right so in a desire to pull heaven onto the hill of our little town called Pascagoula, I have a diagram that I want to show you. Okay, so we're going to go back to the scribbly screen. I feel like, uh, you know, Mr. Rogers going to the kingdom of make-believe. All right, boys and girls, let's go see what the magic train has for us today. All right, in this verse, you're going to see how it is that we go through dealing with with the dirty air between one another, how we deal with it in a way that is godly. All right? What God wants is for, for us to be up on the top of the hill. All right? this, is, uh, this is verse 32. In verse 32 of chapter 4, it talks about forgiveness. And that creates something that Jesus wanted for all his followers. Blessed are those who are peacemakers. Now, before we can focus on forgiveness, which we will get to coming next Sunday and the Sundays beyond, we're going to start today. Uh, but before we can get to it, we must know which sides of the hill you and I are more predisposed to being. We're more predisposed to this side. Not peace and forgiveness, but attacking or when it comes to issues between us and our enemies avoiding I don't have enough space 
Verse 26, don't let the sun go down on your anger. That means deal with it. Don't avoid it. I don't know that that necessarily means do it within a 24-hour period. Don't let the sun go down. I mean, uh, we could move to Alaska where the sun doesn't go down for 30 days and be mad at our spouse for a month. I don't think that's the point. I think the point is don't ignore it. Deal with it. Don't act as if it's not there. But for me, the easiest thing to deal with, because I think that's really our issue, avoiding. Um, something that I think we'd all agree on is not attacking. And this is verse um, 31. Wrath, anger, clamor, evil, evil speaking. Now, at one point, we all had the predisposition to enjoy watching a good attack. How many times were you at high school and a fight broke out and all of a sudden, what did you do? Or maybe you didn't. Maybe you're a good person. But when the, when, the, when the fight happened, I got around. I wanted to see it. Everyone gathered around in a circle. We have an appetite for it. And you may think you don't have an appetite for it now, but you just might. Maybe not through physical violence, which is one of our Earth's biggest issues, but maybe through this thing that Paul was alluding to. Uh, don't hurt people with your mouth. Don't let corrupt words proceed out of your mouth. This thing called gossip. Now, I think one of the biggest misconceptions in church is that gossip is more, and we were talking about this Wednesday night, gossip is mostly attached to the idea, this is the way people think, of whether or not it's true. Therefore, if someone thinks, well, I'm telling the truth, it must not be God. I'm not gossiping. I'm telling the truth. You ever heard somebody say that? And all of a sudden, they look like one of those bobbleheads in a car. <laughs> yeah. Now, I know a whole bunch of stuff about my wife, and I could tell you everything about her. And I know it. It's true. But that would be gossip because of this reason. The main thrust of gossip is that you're uncovering someone in a way that they don't want to be covered, uncovered. Like, like Noah's sons after the flood. When he was tired from his work and he had a few too many, I would have too, feeding that many animals for that long, for a year in that boat, the smell. He passes out and Ham brings his brothers to show dad's nakedness. Look at dad. Look at dad. <laughs> now he's upset, not because it wasn't true, Noah's upset not because he wasn't naked and Ham said he was. No, it was true. He was upset because his son uncovered him. Now what if I had the ability, let's say for the past uh, five years, your pastor had the ability to access all the things you've done or thought of that would embarrass you the most if I had access to them. All right? Now, not only do I have access to them, but since I have my new toy, I could put all of it up on the screen. Now, what if you saw those most intense places of embarrassment there? How would that feel? It wouldn't be a lie, but it would certainly be uncovering. So we understand not attacking, but we also are not called to avoid. Avoiding, I think, is um, what, may be, what may be most of our problem. Because uh, when we avoid, we don't deal with the issue. We, don't, we act like it's not happening. But there is an issue between us and someone else. And it's called for reconciliation and forgiveness. Somewhere up here but rather we stay here. Um, you could act like it's not happening, or you could know it's happening, but you want nothing to do with it. Now you may think if you're avoiding the issue that it's going away, but more than likely, you're getting bitter. When you avoid it and don't deal with it, it's not as if it goes away. I'm, this is my personal experience. I know uh, I had... A roommate one time, when MJ and I just got married, we lived with this uh, couple that were dear friends. 
And eventually, um, the spouse of my buddy got very jealous of my relationship with him, and so she pretty much started treating me what I would call sub-K9. And uh, <laughs> true story. And so eventually, we just parted ways, right? We just left. I just avoided the issue. Now, for months and years after that, every time I would think about this girl, and I could mention her name, so easy, but I wouldn't do it because we're online. <laughs> every time I thought about her name, it's not as if it was just in my brain. I felt it. I felt it every time. And I would sit there and I would ruminate on it. I'd pick it up and chew on it some more. Heat up. Now, I never got in contact with her again, but it's very possible that if I would gotten in contact with her again, that the junk would have been there. You would have been able to feel it. It was there. It's not as if it goes away. Just removing yourself from a situation that you have from someone else, here's the logic. You're at the scene of a crime. You're in a wreck. Your leg is all busted up. The EMT comes to you and says, get on the stretcher, and you says, no, I just want to go home. Well, the EMT looks at you like you're three fries short of a Happy Meal because he knows if you leave the scene of a crime, it's not as if you leave the injury there. You take it with you. I'm just going to leave this marriage. Then I'll get away from the problem. Maybe. More than likely, you're taking the problem with you. You never settled it. I'm just going to leave this job. I'll get away from the problem. Maybe. Maybe you were the problem. And you just took it with you. Because remember, wherever you go, there you are. I'm just going to get out of this family. You've taken it with you. So, up here. Not avoiding, not attacking. Up here. How do you start? You start with opening your heart to the idea of forgiveness. All right? Just start with opening your heart to the idea. All right? Forgiveness is not closing your eyes to what happened. It's not approving what happened. It's not excusing what happened. And it's certainly not pretending that it didn't hurt. It's dealing with it in a godly way. You may say, but someone has to pay. I was hurt pretty bad. This is too heavy for me, Brother Eddie. Someone has to pay. Well, let me say this. Somebody did. Crucify him. Crucify him. But what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death. How about I chasten him and let him go? No. Crucify him. Pilate gave his sentence, and he released them. The one they requested was a murderer sent into their midst. The one who was innocent to be hung. And as he hung... For these sins that are too heavy, that someone has to pay for, he said something ridiculous. He said, Father, forgive them. But they don't deserve that forgiveness, Brother Eddie. You're right. They don't deserve that forgiveness. They've done something to you that is so heavy and so deep in your heart I understand the idea of some cosmic system of justice and they have transgressed it and they don't deserve it. I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm not arguing with you. The only thing I would suggest is that I don't deserve it either. And neither do you. But we've received it. But they caused me too much pain. It's more than you know, Brother Eddie. I, Brother Eddie, I know you've had some hurt. 
But this hurt that I have is different than your hurt. I'm betrayed. I'm wounded. I'm hurt. It is more than you know. I agree. But it's not more than Jesus knows. And if you open your heart to this idea of forgiveness, you have opened your heart to Him to come in and be a journey partner with you through the hurt. Remain in me. And you've allowed my grace to be in your heart. Remain in this idea of attacking or avoiding. And as Paul says, you have given a place in your heart for the devil to come in and have his way. But how do I start? I can't forgive him. I can't possibly. That's fine. That's not how you start. Here's how you start. It's real simple. I bet you can do this. You may not get in your heart, deal with the junk yet. You may not be able to get with the person and start reconciliation, because that's what happens up here on this hill of peace, reconciliation with the person. You may not be ready for that. We're going to get there. But what you could do today is pray the very prayer that Jesus prayed as he hung for his accusers and by his accusers. You may not be able to forgive in your heart, but you could say, Lord, would you forgive this person? God, would you forgive this person for what they've done? And not just them. And God, would you forgive me for my part in it? You may not be able to call them up yet and say, I'm sorry, but you can say, God, forgive me for the part I played. All right? So, the chancel is open this morning. This is your altar call. This is a heaven or hell altar call. It's not about your eternal abode this morning. It's about whether or not you're participating in pulling heaven into this place or pulling hell up into this place based on your responses. Man, we're together. Open your heart to the Lord. Let's pull it down few questions before I open the chancel rail up. You chew on these as you go to lunch. Am I more predisposed to attack or avoid? And why? Or who is the enemy in my life that I need to reconcile with? Name it. As we close with the final hymn, I invite you to the altar. You will find me there. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for your holy word that is as real and as heavy and as radical and as dangerous to our own sense of the way we like things as it was when you preached it. God, we pray that you help us to not be just fans on the sideline, cheering you on. Help us to be followers. Help us to be people who are on your team. On a team together. Advancing the ball for your kingdom in this place. Pulling heaven down now, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to use your hymnals and turn to 338 or to look at the words on the board. Let's rise, please. <laughs> Oh,
Take the hand of your neighbor and receive this benediction. As you do the reconciling work of staying on that hill of peace, becoming peacemakers just as Christ was, neglecting the predisposition to avoid or attack, may you see heaven descend like a dove on this hill that we call Pascagoula in his name. Amen.